Hey everyone, this is lecture number seven for video games and literature. Uh, this week I'll be talking about audience and doing research. Uh, your tasks this week are to play a Gone Home game. Uh, it's a game for PC. Hopefully you picked it up uh, when it was on sale uh, the last couple weeks. You're to write a post in which you compare Gone Home to the novel Ready Player One. Uh, please contribute your 500 words or more to discussion by Sunday at 10 p.m. like usual. And uh, your first draft of your critical paper, the last major paper of the class, is going to be due on Sunday as well. Uh, that means that next week, our last week of class, is going to be peer review week. Uh, so this will be our last lecture uh, discussing course content. Last week we talked about stakes, uh, the answer to the so what question uh, that has multiple circles of relevance. Uh, we talked about uh, certain items in a it certain times can have a, uh, relevance or stakes for an author. They can have relevance for uh, the text or how the text works. Uh, relevance for you as the audience and then the larger social cultural. And we talked about how the stakes you want to shoot for in the, the uh, writing that you're going to do uh, on an academic level uh, is are going to be the ones that move across multiple uh, of these circles of relevance. The so ones that uh, have textual importance that you find interesting and have a larger uh, value to a, a, a social cultural uh, sphere. Uh, stakes, uh, and I mentioned last time, uh, and I want to expand on today, stakes always are for uh, a particular group. So um, when we ask what's at stake, we're also uh, thinking about uh, at stake for whom. So some stakes affect large groups and others only affect individuals. So if you think about uh, the essay that you're going to write next week or for next week, one of the things that's at stake in the essay is your, uh, is your grades. And so if you ask the question, who's it's, uh, for whom are your grades at stake? Obviously, uh, you. Uh, I imagine your family would probably be uh, have some stake in you getting good grades. Uh, your teacher... Uh, if they care about you like they should, <laughs> they uh, will have some stake in how well you do. Maybe a potential employer will be concerned with uh, how well you did in your composition class. But beyond that, there's not a whole lot of uh, social cultural value to whether or not you score well on one paper in your, uh, in your English class. There are some you know, larger questions about you know, the state of education, uh, but those aren't necessarily things that, that would bear on uh, particular points you're making in an argument about a piece of literature. They're just sort of in the background. And there are always you know, different multiple stakes going on all the time. Uh, but you know, if you were writing an essay on Ready Player One, uh, the larger issue of uh, language instruction in the U.S. Uh, is a background issue wouldn't really necessarily be something you, you would uh, be talking directly to. So for another example, uh, who has a stake in a formal analysis analysis of Anastasia at the Metro? Uh, well, obviously, Ezra Pound might. He's dead, though, so um, he can't care about that. <laughs> uh, literary scholars, of course, are going to be concerned about Anastasia at the Metro uh, and how we analyze its form. Uh, but it's going to be a particular subgroup of literary scholars. Uh, one's particularly interested in poetry. Uh, for example, I don't, I don't work on poetry, so... Uh, formal analysis of Innocation and Metro doesn't have a whole lot of relevance to me. Uh, however, uh, the chair of my dissertation, uh, Brian Reed, he he works on uh, poetry, and so he might care about a particularly interesting uh, observation about the form of Innocation and Metro. The, an analysis of that poem might have stakes for you if you're taking a class on it, uh, so you might find someone else's observation particularly useful. Uh, poets uh, would be interested in that. And I left this last here question marks because it kind of depends on the argument. Uh, if you're making some sort of claim that's able to connect across multiple circles of stakes, you might be able to get out to a larger socio-cultural area of relevance. Um, that might not be particularly obvious. So, for example, if you were able to read something in the form of the Station of the Metro that could connect to Ezra Pound's um, life as a Nazi sympathizer, that might be uh, <laughs> something that has larger stakes beyond just literary circles.
Maybe not, because uh, that's kind of well known at this point, but uh, it's possible. In any case, that's kind of what we're shooting for, to be able to move from uh, smaller audiences to larger audiences. Last time we talked about uh, the stakes of Ready Player One, and I showed you this slide uh, where uh, I listed a, a bunch of social cultural stakes that were uh, brought up in the, in the first couple pages. Class, high versus low culture, significance versus influence, mass media, real versus virtual, all that kind of stuff. And you know, one of the interesting things, or one of the challenging things about writing about fiction is that, you know, well, obviously it's not real. So when you're talking about what's at stake in Ready Player One for the issue of class, uh, Ready Player One story is made up. So does it tell us anything about class at all? Or what can it actually tell us about class, given that uh, it, it's not a you know a, a study of inner city Chicago or something like that, right? So what are the stakes of fiction, or how do we think about what's at stake in fiction? Uh, on the left here, some you know, fairly straightforward things that we can see at stake are you know aesthetics, how is it written, uh, tradition or history uh, of writing. Uh, which is also fed into a uh, history of language or how language works. The words gain meaning from the ways that they're used, so uh, novels being a long treatment of different uses of language obviously have some investment in the use of language or, or how words mean. And if it has investment in the way that words mean, that has investment in ideas. Uh, so it, where it may not be able to tell us anything particularly about uh, the specifics of how uh, uh, class is experienced on a day-to-day -day level in you know, 2014 uh, in New Orleans for different communities. Ready Player One can tell us something about uh, the idea of class or how class functions, potentially. Uh, which is to say, fiction is a way to think about culture is, or is a... Uh, uh, always has, to some degree, uh, culture at stake. So for example, I have this example down here, what some of you all noted, uh, the poor environment in which Ready to Player One takes place, uh, the, the game itself, the Oasis, uh, being used by many as a, as a way to escape a really <laughs> bad situation following the, the, the oil crisis. So the environment like the actual lived environment that we're a part of isn't necessarily directly at stake in Ready Player One. Uh, there may be some argument about it being printed on paper and, and that having an, an environmental impact, the actual physical object of Ready Player One. Uh, but what happens in the novel doesn't really do anything to our environment. Right? It doesn't really change. May, it doesn't really have any environmental impact on its own. Uh, it may, however, change the way we think about the environment. It may think, make us think about you know, where we're headed or how particular... And that's kind of what you know, near-future science fiction usually does, is uh, try to play out or think through a scenario uh, derived from some situation that's happening now. And so, in that sense, uh, by causing us to think about the environment, uh, it may... Uh, eventually have some kind of impact on the environment also, depending on how it gets taken up and, and how seriously people take it. So the question of for whom for fiction is going to be communities invested in culture or specific acts of, uh, aspects of culture. So I know that's, that's really vague, but it, again, it's going to depend on uh, the argument uh, and the kind of topic you're addressing uh, more than anything else. So uh, scholars are going to be interested in culture, historians, artists, members of particular cultural groups, the, anyone who might care about the ideas that are addressed. So for example, uh, what's at stake or what's at stake for whom in Gone Home? Uh, one of the uh, clear issues um, that is completely obvious is going to be uh, the uh, dealing with uh, homosexual themes and the homosexual relationship between the two, two, the two uh teenage girls in the story. Obviously this is going to have some level of interest or something at stake for gay and lesbian communities. 
uh, particularly since this is such a positive representation of marginalized of this marginalized identity position, uh, it in is that sense pretty rare, especially it's pretty rare in the gaming circles, really, uh, which gives it uh, stakes for gamers and gamer culture. Uh, gaming culture tends to be uh, pretty. How do I put this? Masculinist, uh, heterosexual, normative, and and really not very accepting in general. And so, to see a game or something in the form of a game uh, that's treating uh, very seriously and with real uh, tenderness uh, a homosexual relationship, it, it's real value. It's something really at stake in how that plays out or how that's taken up. Uh, in a larger sense, you might think about. Uh, this game having stakes for teenagers who felt ostracized by uh, feeling different. If we think of this as sort of, if you want to abstract the specifics of the homosexual relationship to this, the, a larger feeling of, you know, just being different. But there may also be others. Uh, I'm sure you can think of other people for whom this game is going to have stakes or different communities for which this game is going to have stakes. So how do you know uh, the stakes for a particular community? There are really only two options. You can join it uh, or you can study it. So in the case of uh, communities that are invested in narrative, uh, what you would do is you end up reading journals in the field. If you take our previous example of Gone Home and its treatment of a uh, lesbian relationship, you might take uh, to the internet in particular to find uh, responses to the game from a uh, gay and lesbian community to see what they're interested in, what they're invested in, how they thought about it, uh, see what the kind of conversation is surrounding that, or uh, other gamers that were trying to, or gamers or uh, the game journalists, uh, game scholars, folks like that who are trying to think through maybe this game in particular, or if you take a step out, uh, issues of representation in digital media or issues of uh, gay and lesbian identities in digital media. Uh, those are a little bit more abstract uh, and a little bit more general, uh, but those are issues that pertain to what's going on in Gone Home. Uh, so you know, when you're working with something uh, like Gone Home, which is a, a game that, that came out pretty recently, I think last year, I think it's the 2013 game, uh, the uh, number of academic studies of this specific game are going to be pretty few. In fact, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to find anything that's dealing specifically with Gone Home, just given how uh, slowly the academic publishing cycle works. So where you probably find things treating Gone Home would be uh, on uh, gamer blogs, uh, game journalist blogs, uh, or blogs of serious people who uh, write about games critically. Uh, and if you were going to go to the academic route, you want to see how Gone Home fit into an academic conversation about uh, gender and sexuality, you would probably have to start with the uh, <clears throat> uh, gay and lesbian studies uh, in general as a sort of foundation to see what conversations are happening there and then move to uh, digital media studies or maybe uh, look for things that overlap. So uh, some kind of study of homosexuality online, probably going to be by Lisa Nakamura. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm talking sort of at length about this because uh, we're, we're preparing for our critical paper here. Uh, my critical paper, that's going to be a paper uh, in which you're trying to join a critical conversation about uh, some uh, primary text, uh, games or, or literature in our case. Uh, so this is going to be a thousand-word essay on a critical topic, and so that's going to be some sort of issue that has stakes. Uh, and you're going to use an analysis of one or more of our texts, you know, one or more of our texts to explore these issues. So the first thing you want to do is pick a topic, pick something that you obviously is going to be relevant to the stuff we've been studying. Uh, then you want to find your relevant primary source. What's the text you want to work on. You know, you might actually do these in reverse. You might find the text that you really want to work on uh, and then pick a topic that, that you know, merges out of your interest in that text. Again, you know, it's okay to be working for something that has stakes for you. So if you're interested in issues of gender and sexuality, maybe Gone Home is, is an ideal text for you to work on because you're already keyed into to thinking about those ideas and there's something that you're, you're interested in. 
and then use that to build outwards uh, towards your invest towards your contribution to uh, the social and cultural discussion. So once you have your your text and you have a topic set up, uh, brainstorm like we've been practicing, then outline so you can get in a sense of how you're thinking about these issues as they relate to your primary source. So once you have some of your ideas in place, then uh, you're going to want to look for secondary references. Now this paper is going to require you to be in conversation with at least two secondary sources, uh, and one of them is going to it needs to be academic. Uh, so you have some time to look things up. If you don't have all of your sources integrated in the draft stage, that's all right. Uh, try to do it so I can give you some comments on it and we can we can give you some feedback on how you're doing it uh, but if you don't get to uh, integrating your uh, secondary sources in the first draft that's okay if this is if your first draft is you thinking through these ideas and trying to get your your uh, analyses in place that's cool because you really want to think of your interaction with secondary sources uh, as a kind of conversation that you're having so you have ideas and there are ideas out there in the world. And so you need to go and look them up to be able to respond to them appropriately. So whenever you're, any piece of writing is always happen. it never happens in isolation. It's always happening in, in uh, conversation with someone else, even if that person is just you. Uh, so to know your audience and to know what uh, other people thinking about the ideas that you're thinking about think, uh, you have to read what they've written. Uh, so that means you have to go to the secondary sources. And so in the case of, uh, as I was saying, in the case of something like Gone Home, you might go read the, you know, rev bunch of reviews about how uh, people responded to Gone Home. You might read blog posts of people analyzing it. You might go on forums to see what people said. See, in video games, it's a little bit, the, the range of secondary sources is a little bit broader because uh, it's still so new as a medium. So another thing that, that's useful about it is you can when you go to the academic sources, you can see uh, how professionals are thinking about this. You can see what they are interested in and invested in. Uh, you can see how the conversation is formed uh, on a professional level, uh, which then allows you to find some place where you can contribute to the conversation. So if everybody already <clears throat> takes for granted some aspect of the text, you pointing it out wouldn't necessarily be valuable. And so then you might want to point out something different about it or how it uh, looks, how you're looking at it slant or how you might be taking an opposite position to something that's sort of established in the in the critical literature. So the idea is, again, to think of this as a conversation. So you're, you're going to the secondary sources to see what people are talking about, to see what people are saying. And then your essay is in some, you want to shape it as a kind of response. And what is it that you have to tell uh, these people that you've read about the game that you've played or the novel that you've read? So you think about it that way. It's, it's, it's not so much... Uh, kind of hide-and-seek uh, proof uh, situation, which is the way a lot of people take secondary sources, that I think this, and now here are three people that say the same thing, and so I have proved that that is the case. That, that's not an interesting paper, especially for a literature class. Uh, what is much more interesting is to say, this is what several people think about this. However, they don't seem to consider uh, these ideas um, that I'm going to present. One of the ways that one of the ways that using secondary sources has been formalized uh, by composition scholar Gerald Graff is uh, as a they say, I say conversation. So when you do your research, you look to see what people have said, you summarize or you characterize what they, what their position is, and then you respond with, with your position. So for example, uh, one of the critical conversations surrounding Gone Home is whether or not it constitutes a game uh, because it doesn't really have an objective, among other things. It, uh, t the argument is basically that it's more like an interactive story or something like that. So to a uh, uh, article uh, that you found that says that Gone Home isn't a game, you might respond with, I say that whether it's a game or not is irrelevant and obscures how the game uses game-like interactivity to address serious important themes pertaining to gender and sexuality. That's one I just came up with, so maybe but it takes this kind of form, right? So you find out what people are saying, what's the conversation, they are all saying this, or they seem to be saying this, uh, and then here's what I have to say about that. Okay, so for, for your post for this week, uh, I'm asking you to uh, compare Gone Home to Ready Player One. Uh, this is a way to extend our discussion of 
stakes and how we look for stakes. So you want to pick a topic, some sort of critical co topic that they have in common, and then discuss how each treats it. And you, if you're interested in writing about either of these texts, this might be a good way to uh, warm up for your paper. And if it turns out that you end up using uh, this or really any of your other posts uh, as a foundation for your uh, your critical paper, that's that's more than all right. In fact, I'd recommend it if you if you've been able to write a post that you that you like or something that's got an idea that you want to expand on. So again, your task for this week is to play Gone Home. Uh, write a post that compares Gone Home with Ready Player One, contribute your 500 words or more discussion, and then uh, submit your draft one of your critical essay. Uh, that's going to go to your uh, week seven folder. Yeah, so please submit that to your week seven folder. And, and like we did uh, in week five, we'll be doing the uh, um, peer review next week. Again, all of this appears in your uh, in the, the folder for this week, the week seven folder, uh, with a prompt for the paper, uh, description of the post, uh, and so on. And if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to e email or post on the support section on Google+. And I look forward to seeing you all online.